Hello, um, my name is Tom McClelland and I'm a Leverhulme Early Career Research Fellow at the University of Warwick. Um, my paper makes case for what I call the mental affordance hypothesis. This is the hypothesis that objects or situations can present opportunities for us to perform certain mental actions and that we have a special sensitivity to these opportunities that can go a long way to explaining how and why we perform the mental actions that we do. So to make my case for the mental affordance hypothesis, the first thing I need to do is unpack the concept of affordances. So the literature on affordances focuses on affordances for bodily actions. So I'm going to talk about those for a while and then make a case for why this concept should be extended to encompass mental actions as well. So the term affordances was introduced by the ecological psychologist J.J. Gibson. In his final work, he um, describes affordances as follows. He says, the affordance is in the environment what it offers the animal, what it provides or furnishes either for good or ill. The verb to afford is found in the dictionary, but the noun affordance is not. So he's making it clear here, he's inventing a word. This is a word that many people have gone on to use in all sorts of different contexts. He goes on, I have made it up. I mean by it something that refers to both the environment and the animal in a way that no existing term does. So this neologism has been taken up across a vast range of disciplines. So you'll find it in music, anthropology, design theory, AI, neuroscience, cognitive psychology, phenomenology, philosophy of perception, and many other disciplines. Now, the fact that Gibson's concept has been taken up so widely is possibly an indicator that he was on to something interesting here. Um, but this, this comes at a price. Um, the price is that the term is used in lots of different ways by lots of different people. So it's a bit of a terminological minefield. So in talking about affordances, the first thing we have to do is pin down exactly what our understanding of affordances is. So here's my best attempt to give three individually necessary and jointly sufficient conditions of something being an affordance. So take this apple, for example. I want to say that this apple affords eating because it satisfies the following three conditions. The first condition is that the apple presents an opportunity to perform some action, phi, in this case, the act of eating. Now, opportunities for action are probably best cashed out in terms of pairs of dispositions. So I have the dispositional property of having a certain capacity um, to eat things. And the apple has the dispositional property of being edible by certain kinds of creatures those two dispositions together and you've got something like an opportunity for action i can deploy my skills in eating toward this object the second condition is that this special property this dispositional property is perceptible okay so it should be fairly uncontroversial that the apple has this dispositional property of being edible by me what's more interesting is that is the claim that this property is a perceptible property of the apple. So besides seeing it as shiny um, and as smooth and as having a certain shape, I see it as being edible. This is, this is a claim that Gibson himself emphasised. The third condition isn't something that Gibson got into. This is something that comes up more in the contemporary cognitive psychology literature. This is the condition that perceiving X involves the potentiation of the act of fying. So roughly what that means is when I see the edible apple, the act of eating is kind of primed. My motor system gets ready to perform the act of eating. Now, the first two conditions, I hope, um, are fairly self-explanatory, though, of course, I explain them in more detail in the paper. The third one, I think, needs a little more. The psychologists Tucker and Ellis introduce the notion of potentiation as follows. They say that the perception of an object results in the potentiation of the actions that can be made toward it. And this potentiation involves the actual activation of motor representations of those acts. So according to various experiments that um, I explain in more detail in the paper, when you see a teapot, for example, the act of reaching for that teapot is readied. And there's a kind of motor representation of the act of reaching, whether or not we in fact go on to reach it. And even whether or not reaching for the teapot is something that fits at all with your goals and with the tasks that you're currently performing. Some interesting data in favour of potentiation comes from pathological case studies. So there's a condition called utilisation behaviour caused by certain kinds of brain damage and patients who've suffered this brain damage compulsively utilise items around them. So when they walk into the doctor's office, for example, if there's a toothbrush on the doctor's table, they'll brush their teeth with the toothbrush. Um, 
Now this condition has been interpreted in terms of a deficit in the suppression of potentiated actions. So the idea is here that all subjects, healthy subjects and neuroatypical subjects, when they see the toothbrush, the motor process responsible for brushing one's teeth is automatically activated. The difference is in healthy subjects, this process then gets suppressed further down the line. Whereas because of their brain damage, patients with utilisation behaviour are unable to suppress this motor process. Another interesting thing to consider when thinking about potentiation is our agential phenomenology. So I think that sometimes we experience our actions not so much as things that we spontaneously initiate, but instead as things that we allow to unfold. So let's say a tennis ball is bouncing towards you. Consider what it's like to catch the ball. Now this isn't a mere reflex, it's within our control whether or not we do catch the ball. But this isn't an act, I'd say, that we initiate ourselves. It's more one that we allow to unfold. And I think this fits nicely with the data surrounding potentiation. Because on the potentiation account, when we see the tennis ball coming towards us, the act of ca catching the ball is automatically readied. So in order to catch the ball, all we have to do is permit this motor process to unfold. We don't have to start the motor process up from scratch. One last note on affordances. Some affordances are what we call soliciting affordances. So rather than representing a mere possibility of action, sometimes we perceptually represent an item as positively calling out for us to perform the afforded action. So many people report having the following visual experience. They see Justin Bieber's face as calling out to be slapped. There's something about his face that invites slapping. So here we don't merely visually represent the property of being slappable, we represent the property of demanding slapping. So many of the most vivid experiences of affordances are what we might call soliciting affordances. So many of the examples I discuss in the paper are these invitation-like affordances. So hopefully you've got a grip now on what it means for something to afford a bodily action. Um, but I want to argue that there can also be affordances for mental action. So in the vast literature on affordances, almost every example of afforded action that comes up is an example involving bodily action. I want to say that there are also affordances for mental actions. So this is a claim that only crops up very rarely in the literature. So what is a mental affordance? Well, we can just tweak the three conditions of being an affordance as follows to give an account of mental affordances. So something is a mental affordance if it presents an opportunity to perform some mental action phi. This has to be perceptible and the perception of X has to involve the potentiation of the mental act of phi. So we're looking for cases that satisfy all three of these conditions. If there are such cases, then the mental affordance hypothesis is true. Now, satisfying the first condition should be fairly easy. Opportunities for mental action are all around us. Um, a good documentary, for example, might um, present us an opportunity to reflect upon a certain topic. A fork in the road might present us with an opportunity to deliberate about which way to go. A photo album might present us with an opportunity to reminisce about our childhood. A fantasy novel might present us with an opportunity to imagine certain supernatural goings on. And a place of worship might present us with an opportunity to contemplate. Now, of course, this doesn't suffice for there being mental affordances. There are some more demanding conditions, the second and third condition, that have to be satisfied. So in the paper, I look at three cases in a lot more detail and try to argue that the second and third conditions are indeed satisfied by those cases. Now, my strategy in the paper is to assume that everyone's on board with the idea of bodily affordances and then to take you one station at a time further away from the bodily and into the realm of the mental. So the first case I look at is affording attention. So attention is, I think, a mental act, but it's known to have very intimate links to the bodily. Going further into the mental, I then make a case for things in our environment affording certain imaginative acts. Now, the imaginative acts I look at are imagined bodily acts. So there's still a close link to the bodily here. Third and finally, I look at affording calculation. So this is a mental act that I think has very little to do with the bodily. So if there are affordances to count things or to perform other mathematical calculations, then we have something that's, that's a, a mental affordance which has very little to do with the bodily at all. 
So the first example I look at is affording attention. And my case revolves around the following example. Imagine you're working hard on a philosophy paper in the library, but some muppet on the table next to you has his music turned up too loud. I want to say that the idiot's music affords attention. More specifically, I think it presents a soliciting affordance for us to vocally attend. Now this is an invitation to attend that we're free to ignore. We might succeed in keeping our attention trained on our work. But this affordance is nevertheless a feature of our visual experience. The second example I consider is affording imagination. So imagine you're stepping over a series of stepping stones. The first stone might afford uh, a certain stretch with the left leg. The second stone might afford a certain stretch with the right leg. But when you get to a particularly tricky stone, I want to say that a certain mental act is afforded, specifically the mental act of rehearsing in imagination the required bodily movement. My third and final example is a jar of marbles affording counting. Now my case for this revolves around the phenomenon of utilisation behaviour, which I mentioned earlier. So it turns out that some patients with utilisation behaviour compulsively count things in their environment. Now if their compulsive toothbrushing behaviour, for example, is to be explained in terms of affordance perception, then so too should their compulsive counting behaviour. But counting, of course, is a mental action. Therefore, we have a reason to think that there's sensitivity to mental affordances here. So those are three examples I look at in some detail in the paper. My aim in the paper isn't just to argue that there are at least some mental affordances. My aim rather is to open up what I hope is an exciting new research program. So moving forward, I think there's a few things we should look into. First, I think we should look into whether the experimental evidence in favour of bodily affordance might be paralleled by experimental evidence in favour of mental affordances. Second, I think we can look further into pathological case studies. So I've mentioned utilisation behaviour, but other conditions might fruitfully ex be explained in terms of our sensitivity to mental affordances and certainly deficits in that sensitivity. Third, people offer interesting adaptational explanations of why we would be able to perceive affordances for bodily action. I think we can look into whether parallel adaptational explanations can be found for why we would be perceptively sensitive to opportunities for mental action. Fourth, affordances have played a significant role in our understanding of bodily skills, skills like um, having learned to drive, for example. Um, can similar lessons be learned when we look at mental skills, such as learning um, certain argumental skills or certain mathematical skills? Does the acquisition of these skills involve us coming to be appropriately sensitive to affordances for mental action. Fifth and finally, um, affordances for bodily action um, seem to have a significant role in our perceptual phenomenology. Perhaps then affordances for mental action have a significant role to play in our cognitive phenomenology. I think that's something that deserves further reflection. Those are all topics for the future, but if there's one lesson I hope I can get you to take away with you right now, it's the following. We cannot assume that all afforded actions are bodily. It's at least an open possibility that there are some affordances for mental action. And this is a possibility that I think deserves serious examination. Thank you.